Thank you very much, Baruch, and thanks to um, everyone at uh, Veston Hag. Um, as soon as I was invited to this event, uh, I thought, that sounds really cool. I really want to be part of that. So, <laughs> so it has proved to be, and I'm, 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 I'm really enjoying it. Um, and the unusual format is, is very refreshing. So I fear that this paper is going to be little more than a footnote to Moira Gatens' paper this morning. As you're going to hear, I'm going to be picking up on a lot of the same themes. Um, but I think I go somewhere slightly different at the end, so hopefully that'll, that'll give us lots of scope for discussion. <clears throat> so, in his most recent book, scientist James Lovelock writes, we must abandon the politically and psychologically loaded idea that the Anthropocene is a great crime against nature. The Anthropocene is a consequence of life on Earth, an expression of nature. This strikes me as a profoundly Spinozistic insight. Lovelock is the inventor of Gaia theory, the theory that the Earth is one living organism that regulates itself and strives to preserve itself through complex systems and individual living things. This way of thinking already resonates with Spinoza's monism and naturalism, with Gaia being an alternative name for God, substance, or nature. As Spinoza puts it, one individual whose parts vary in infinite ways without any change of the whole individual. Lovelock has been warning us for many decades of the global heating that will permanently alter human and non-human ways of life. Lovelock's more recent pronouncements on the Anthropocene <coughs> reveal a spinozistic understanding of the profoundly amoral nature of nature. Gaia strives to preserve itself, to preserve life as such, and is indifferent to the particular life forms that life takes on. In other words, Gaia, God, or nature does not have any interest in preserving this or that species, including the human species, or any particular configuration of nature. Lovelock is also spinozistic in understanding that human transformations of the earth are part of nature, however much we may think of certain human actions as harming or destroying nature. By seeking our own advantage, Human beings do not destroy nature. We are nature, transforming itself. Gaia, God, or nature transforms itself through us and in us, and there is no moral valence to that transformation. The moral valence of human transformations of the earth comes from its value for us as human beings. The transformations that have taken place during the Anthropocene <coughs> pose some problems for Spinozian ethics, in which good is defined as whatever we certainly know to be useful to us, and which we therefore strive for. Our transformations of the earth have been immensely good for human empowerment. The moral valence of human transformations of the earth comes from its value for us as human beings. So the transformations that have taken place during the Anthropocene pose some problems for Spinozian ethics in which good is defined as whatever we certainly know to be useful to us and which we therefore strive for. And our transformations of the earth have been immensely good <coughs> for human empowerment. The Anthropocene is the name increasingly given to the geological era characterized by the human power to use the stored energy of the sun to transform the physical world on a massive scale. Lovelock dates the origin of the Anthropocene to 1712 with Thomas Newcomen's invention of the coal-fired steam pump. Now, people had burned coal prior to this date, but the steam pump burned coal in order to drain mines and dig up more coal, unlocking enormous stores of energy. <coughs> this was an invention that gave groups of people greater power in every sense of that word. Power to produce light and heat, to extend the working day, power to produce and move goods around the world, power to travel and build and become wealthier. And with this came greater power in Spinoza's sense, the power to understand more, the power to be healthier and flourish more, and the power to be more free and secure. These powers of wealth, health, happiness, and freedom have historically not been evenly distributed, but the enhancement of those powers did generate the thinking and action that produced universal benefits, such as clean drinking water, sewerage, electric lighting, and education, generating more opportunities for the enhancement of the population's knowledge and ability to thrive. Presented in this admittedly rather Whiggish way, 
It cannot be denied that the Anthropocene has involved great progress towards achieving what Spinoza takes to be the greatest human goods. Greater power to act, greater power to think, and greater understanding of God or nature itself. If that which increases human action and thinking is good, then deriving energy from fossil fuels has been a very great human good over the past 400 years. Spinoza's ethics suggests that we should rejoice at this enormous increase of human power and knowledge. And similarly, Lovelock, at the age of 100, says that his last word on the Anthropocene is, quote, a shout of joy, joy at the colossal expansion of our knowledge of the world and the cosmos that this age has produced. <coughs> and yet, of course, we cannot rejoice. We cannot rejoice in our ongoing use of fossil fuels because we now know that taking coal, oil, and gas out of the earth contributes to global heating. And we now know that global heating causes massive cascading disruptions of the regulatory systems of weather, geography, and ecology that preserve and sustain human life. <coughs> we cannot rejoice in the burning of the Amazon rainforests or the pollution of the oceans, even if we understand that they are the effects of human beings striving to seek their advantage. Even some unquestionable goods for human flourishing, such as the increased wealth and living standards of millions of people in India and China, give us pause because those increases have led to greater demands for land, energy, and meat. And this is to say nothing of our inability to rejoice in the loss or diminishment of species of insects, plants, animals, and places that sustain our lives and give us joy. The Anthropocene produces in us passions of sadness, longing, guilt, anger, and resentment. These passions are all the more strongly felt because we understand the climate crisis to be anthropogenic. We believe that we caused it through a series of free choices. As Spinoza says, we feel most keenly those passions that were caused by those we believe to have acted freely. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Looking at Spinoza's lexicon of the passions, perhaps the one we should expect to feel most strongly is repentance, sadness accompanied by the idea of oneself as its cause. Yet repentance is strikingly absent in discussions of the climate crisis. We seem to feel all the other sad passions instead. We feel guilty for what we have done and continue to do to exacerbate uh, global heating. We resent our forebears who got us into this situation. And we're angry at the politicians who keep failing to take meaningful action. And overwhelmingly, we feel fear. We fear the predicted effects of 400 years of seeking our own advantage through transforming the earth, effects that will not only be climatic, but also social and political. We fear that our children will inherit an earth so degraded that they have no ground to stand on, we fear that we have caused this devastation to come, the curtailment of our children's flourishing. So the emotion that plagues us is fear of our own power. <coughs> By power here, I mean potentia, a thing's capacity to be what it is and act from its nature, um, as discussed by Spinoza in Ethics Part 3, Propositions 6 and 7. Each thing strives for an indefinite time to persevere in its being and to do those things that follow from its nature. In Ethics Part 4, Spinoza links power to virtue and explains that the more we strive for what is advantageous to our being and acting, the more virtuous and powerful we are. We seek to do those things that preserve our being and increase our power to act. It seems to me unquestionable that seeking to preserve our being and increase our power to act in the current configuration of our societies in the rich West involves being bound up in complex and intractable systems of energy extraction and food production that contribute directly to climate change. <coughs> fear of our own power means that we fear what follows necessarily from our own nature. We fear our essential tendency to seek our advantage. We can only say that we fear our power to the extent that we doubt what its effects will be. 
Fear is a sadness that arises from our imagining an uncertain outcome. Fear is time relative because it relies on our relation to a future about which we have doubts. Once doubt about the future has been removed, fear becomes either despair or confidence. And just as a side note, it's worth noting that confidence is Edwin Curley's translation of the Latin securitas, um, the passion we feel when our doubts about the future have been resolved. So securitas for Spinoza is of course one of the purposes of the state. And normally when we say that for Spinoza the purpose of the state is security, we have something in mind like um, safety or the kind of you know, the security apparatus that we have now in the state. But actually the commonality of this word suggests that the state aims for security um, in the sense of a future free of doubt. Where there's some doubt about the outcome of seeking our advantage, we fear our power. And where there's no doubt that our actions are destructive, we despair of our power. <coughs> now, whenever we feel any kind of sadness, we strive to destroy its cause. If we fear our own power, it follows that we strive to destroy our own striving, or, to quote Spinoza, to avert it from ourselves so that we shall not regard it as present. This results in self-destructive behaviors and attempts to distance ourselves from our own power and desire. Fear of our own power leads us to act in ways that are contrary to our own advantage, even as we are naturally determined to act for the sake of our advantage. We vacillate between seeking our advantage and not seeking it, and we do not want what we want. This Spinoza characterizes as timidity and consternation. This situation in which we feel saddened by our own power and seek to diminish it is one that Spinoza takes to be perverse. It indicates <coughs> very low levels of virtue and knowledge. For the sad passions diminish our power to think and act adequately. And sadness directed towards our own power is a diminishment of our desire to exist. <coughs> The foundation of virtue is the desire to preserve our being and the knowledge of what is certainly good for us. The passions of fear, despair, and confidence, <coughs> to, to quote Spinoza, show a defect of knowledge and a lack of power in the mind. And self-destructive passions indicate ignorance of oneself and very great weakness of mind. In this situation, we have poor knowledge of ourselves and what is good for us, and an inability to think rationally. <coughs> Please excuse me, this uh, coughing has just come on now. <laughs> I was okay earlier today. The result of a cold that I thought finished about two weeks ago, but <clears throat> it's obviously still with me. Okay. Um, so it's worth considering for a few moments the implications of this widespread fear of our own power and the degraded self-knowledge that accompanies it. <coughs> a first implication is the phenomenon of so-called fake news. Now, misinformation has been around for all of human history, nothing new there, but perhaps something characteristic of our age, encapsulated in that phrase post-truth, is indifference to whether what we believe is true or not. We neither assent to nor deny the claims that we are presented with. Everything becomes a matter of doubt and vacillation. Fearing our own power entails that we fear the mind's power to know, and we doubt even our adequate ideas. Remember, for Spinoza, adequate ideas are always subject to being dislodged by strong passions and inadequate ideas. This means that we can doubt knowledge that we previously took to be certain, knowledge that may have been arrived at by solid scientific and inferential methods. So the age of the fear of climate change is also the age of doubt about climate change and distrust in the sciences. <clears throat> Bruno Latour argues that doubt, vacillation, and denial about the climate crisis undermine the surety of facts and lead to indifference about the correspondence of beliefs to the truth. So Latour says, it is because the overall geopolitical situation has to be denied that indifference to the facts becomes so essential. <coughs> A 
A second implication of fear of our own power is the resurgence of essentialism when it comes to claims about ourselves and others. The flourishing of so-called identity politics and the backlash against it are both symptomatic of this essentialism. Now Spinoza is of course an essentialist in the 17th century metaphysical sense that he believes that every individual has an essence. The essence of a human being is to be a finite mode of God and to strive for those things that preserve its being. But this true essence can be obscured by belief that our essence is in fact determined by imagined factors. When we fear our own power, we hold doubtful and inadequate ideas about our identity. And those inadequate ideas often stem from what we feel ourselves to be. And we demand recognition for how we feel ourselves to be defined. Our lack of self-knowledge may have the effect that we demand that confused and inadequate ideas about what we are should be taken seriously as knowledge claims. A third implication of fear of our own power is that we experience our power as a diminishment of power. And consequently, we may feel this disempowerment to be what our power consists in. That is, disempowerment becomes our basis for striving, acting, and thinking, generating a Nietzschean ressentiment. Spinoza calls this humility, which for him is not a virtuous form of self-effacement, but rather an evil and useless passion closely aligned to self-regard, ambition, and envy. Because we naturally rejoice in our own power to act, we perversely feel good about our own weakness, especially if we imagine others' actions to be weaker than our own. And those feelings can be put to political uses. Again, this is not a new phenomenon, but it's one that tends to resurge when people are highly confused about what they are and what their power truly consists in. Our climate fears have loomed behind campaigns for Brexit, Trump, and populist and neo-fascist leaders, all characterized by pride in lack of knowledge and lack of virtue. When we fear our own power and its effects on the ground we stand on, we are all the more subject to those who promise the imagined stabilities of the land and borders of the past. So, <clears throat> the climate crisis produces in us a strong passion of fear that has significant social and political effects. This fear is directed at ourselves, and we believe it to be caused by ourselves, by what human power has done and will continue to do to nature. All passions are linked to inadequate ideas. This one is no different. This one is linked to two in particular. First, the inadequate idea that human beings over the last 400 years were free to take different actions or to exercise their striving in a different way. And second, the inadequate idea that our actions and striving are contrary to nature. These are deep misunderstandings of our place in the world. On the first point, humans were not really free to choose differently. We have no free will for Spinoza. And he says, all things have been predetermined by God from God's absolute nature. Human beings over the last 400 years <coughs> were thoroughly determined, human beings over the last 400 years were thoroughly determined to extend their power and knowledge in ways that they did. And we continue to be so determined. As such, human beings are finite modes of God and part of nature. We do not transcend nature. Nature is not an object standing over against us that we do things to. Nature is the substance of which we are modes. We and our actions follow from the essence of nature. Since a thing cannot contain that which negates it, it is actually impossible that our actions could be contrary to nature. Nature is infinitely variable and in causing changes in nature, we do not diminish or destroy it. Our actions are simply nature changing itself. Seen in this way, what we designate as the climate crisis is just one sequence of nature's infinite variations. What appears as a massive and devastating upheaval from our perspective is business as usual for infinite and eternal nature itself. 
We are not morally responsible for the changing climate, rising sea levels, or extinction of species, and we should get over our feelings of guilt and blame. Indeed, we should get over all our sad passions, for once we truly understand that God is the cause of all things, we understand that God is the cause of our sadness as well. Understanding its cause means that sadness, Spinoza says, ceases to be a passion. That is, it ceases to be sadness. And so, insofar as we understand God to be the cause of sadness, we rejoice. <clears throat> <clears throat> now, while all that is true from a Spinozistic perspective, it's surely not enough. It's not enough to say that it's all part of nature, that we've only acted according to our nature, we've done nothing wrong. For human beings are, after all, causally responsible for the accelerated melting of the polar ice caps and the burning of the Amazon. We are causally responsible for the changes in land use that have removed the habitats of pollinating insects, drastically reducing their numbers. While logically, perhaps, we cannot act contrary to nature as such, we can and do act in ways that are contrary to other things and species striving to preserve their being. The wrongness of these acts consists in their being bad for us. Spinoza famously says that we are entitled to kill animals <coughs> and to use natural resources in our pursuit of our own advantage, our right to do so being based in our greater power. No moral codes govern our relations to non-humans, for those relations take place in the state of nature, where there is no good or evil and no law but natural right. It's important to recognize that for Spinoza, the state of nature does not disappear with the institution of the social contract. It continues to govern those relations that do not come under the legislation of the civil state. Um, so the state of nature continues to govern relations, including human relations, that don't come under the legislation of the civil state. The state of nature <coughs> is a state of constant fear that is bad for human flourishing. To minimize and control our fear of other human powers, it was exigent for human beings, way back when, to form civil states, delimited realms of human activity determined by human laws. These laws reflect what a given community of humans determines is good for their flourishing. But animals and natural things cannot be citizens, and their flourishing is not a goal of the civil state unless their flourishing has a direct impact on our own. We now understand, in a way that Spinoza simply did not, that the flourishing of ice caps, trees, and butterflies does have a direct impact on our own flourishing. Spinoza understands that all things are interconnected, yes, but he understands this in strictly metaphysical terms, not in terms of ecological or biodynamic systems. From his vantage in the 1660s, Spinoza simply would not have understood that it is good and indeed necessary for the preservation of human life that the ice caps remain frozen <coughs> and the Amazon forest remains intact. The understanding of our profound interdependence on all of nature in a biological sense is a product of the knowledge we have gained in the late Anthropocene. We should strive to support the flourishing of other animals and natural things, not out of pity or guilt or fondness, but because their flourishing is essential for our flourishing. We certainly know that it is good for us that the ice caps stay frozen, that the Amazon is not burned, and that bees and butterflies thrive. And according to Spinoza, this certain knowledge should determine us to strive for those ends. <coughs> What prevents us from striving for the flourishing of other beings on Earth is passions and inadequate ideas, yes, but also the lack of a state in which those goods are agreed upon. <clears throat> There's therefore a case on Spinozistic grounds for rethinking political community to incorporate non-humans, going beyond the civil state to form a terrestrial state the goal of which is the flourishing of all the individuals and systems that compose it. One purpose of the civil state <coughs> is to neutralize our fear of violence 
from other human individuals and factions. <clears throat> the terrestrial state would neutralize our fear of the violence that we do to all the members of that state, human and non-human, by virtue of damaging the systems that sustain us. In other words, it would neutralize fear of our own power, the fear that is our constant companion. With respect to other life forms and living systems, we find ourselves in the state of nature, in a state of constant fear, propelled by and horrified by our own natural right to do whatever we can. Perhaps only a political solution in the form of a kind of social contract can save us from this state. The classical social contract story, which we find in Hobbes and Locke and in Spinoza, this story takes place in the Holocene era. That's the era immediately preceding the Anthropocene. To neutralize their fear of mutual violence, human beings had to collectivize their natural right and form the civil state. Doing so enabled them to rationally understand that their flourishing and security depended on the collectivization of their power. In the late Anthropocene, where we now find ourselves, we need to neutralize our fear of human power by forming a terrestrial state that aims at the flourishing of life itself. <coughs> we need to collectivize the powers of all living beings to aim at the preservation of life as such. If we follow James Lovelock, then we already recognize that such a collectivization of powers already exists for living systems already naturally strive for the preservation of life as such. It's we humans that are the problem. We humans need to stop seeing our striving as being opposed to and separate from that overall striving of life. We need to pool our power with the powers of other living beings and see our interests as common to all members of the terrestrial state. Here we see <coughs> a shift away from modern political theory into perhaps something new, something based on a spinozistic way of conceiving nature. Bruno Latour argues that we must replace the modern concept of nature as the framework for human action with a concept of the terrestrial. On this model, the earth itself is understood to be a political actor and politics becomes a sphere in which human beings have a non-central role. In a terrestrial social contract, we give up our natural right over other species, and we agree to follow a broader version of Spinoza's natural or divine law, love thy neighbor. Our neighbors on whom we mutually depend are not exclusively human. As Latour puts it, terrestrials seek to cohabit with other terrestrials under the authority of a power that as yet lacks any political institution. This vision of a politics of the earth is not a romantic return to nature or an attempt to reconstruct nature as it would be without human intervention. This position does not call for the removal of the civil state or the reversal of human progress. Like all political structures, the terrestrial state <coughs> is an artificial public thing, a res publica that must be established by its members and constructed and made to work through laws and institutions. It seems that we already see other terrestrial beings as forming a state. It's a state that we see ourselves to be at odds with, nature as the object alternately of our guilt-ridden violence, our pity or our longing, something over there that we do things to. To join this state requires us humans to understand the fundamental spinozistic truth that we are part of nature, not opposed to it and not protectors of it. So it is that the French Zadist activists, um, a, a group of activists who oppose airport construction, are able to say, we are not defending nature, we are nature defending itself. When we stop fearing our power, we may also be able to get over the other sad passions of guilt and blame and anger that we feel about the climate crisis. Nor will we feel any repentance. For to understand that we are part of nature is to better understand our causal role in the changes occurring on Earth. We understand that our actions in extracting coal, oil, and gas were rational in the past, but are irrational now. And crucially, we understand that they are irrational rather than immoral. 
The sad passions we directed towards ourselves, once they are understood, cease to be passions, and they become actions of the mind. We can start to affirm our own power in its being a part of the power of nature to strive for what is good for nature as a whole. That's the end. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Beth, for struggling through that. Uh, <laughs> your your, your uh, bodily nature was, uh, was uh, in conflict with your agenda there. Yeah, so you, uh, you raised uh, something that actually I wanted to get to in the, in the synthetic session just after this. Uh, that, uh, okay, we, got, we have um, knowledge from science. We have knowledge from science. Uh, which I guess is actually not uh, uncontroversial for, for some people. Uh, people do deny that, that knowledge from science, right? But let's say, okay, uh, we are in uh, this matrix of nature. We are, there's no outside of nature for us. Yet, yet uh, we need to privilege our own survival and for this reason, we need to manage our integrity with nature, the flows, energy flows, or however we want to model that. This is a, I, I, now the, 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 the solution you, you uh, conveyed, which is the, somewhat from, uh, from Latour's Gaia uh, uh, proposal, is uh, also similar to um, what they're doing in Bolivia, for example, where they have Mother Earth as one of uh, as representative in the in the parliament. So they have a representative of Mother Earth on in in the government, and providing a rational voice. Uh, yeah, representative of these forces, which are uh, of, of course they should be also rational, <laughs> according to Spinoza. Um, yeah, uh, and what you are extending is, is a terrestrial version of that, in a way, where we'd have like a United Nations with nature as one of the uh, constituents of the... And, and it, would, it would appear to me that, uh, of course, uh, uh, to be proportional, we'd need to have na uh, nature being more represented than the human part. So I'm just thinking aloud <laughs> at the problems of uh, uh, trying to figure out philosophically through that, uh, that, that question. How do we privilege without being able to be outside? We have to acknowledge our integrity in nature, but how do we pr privilege our own interests in sustaining our life? Because as you said, nature doesn't care, and nature will perpetuate life by itself, and that's fine to thrive without us, right? Is it... Is it moral or ethical for us to even do that? To <laughs> uh, is it moral or ethical for us to do what? To, to seek to uh, elaborate uh, some manner in which we can ensure our <laughs> preservation under these um, conditions. Yes, it's the only ethical position there is. <laughs> what else do we have? I mean, we, we, have, we, have, to, we have to... You know, the, the, the basis of all ethics, Spinoza says, is seeking our advantage. That's what we have to do. The point is we have to recognize that what our advantage is now involves, involves seeking the advantage of all of the Earth systems. That's the point. So, so it's not that we stop seeking our advantage. It's that we, we change the, our understanding of what our advantage is, I think. Um, I mean, admittedly, when one starts to think about the kind of procedural detail of how do we kind of constitute a, a, you know, a global state or something, I mean, of course, it's ridiculous, right? I mean, the idea is a, is a, a concept for thinking. It's not supposed to be a real proposal <laughs> in a way. I mean, I don't know. Um, because, because clearly, a, a, ter a terrestrial state <laughs> would, um, would not be like the United Nations because humans would only be one very small part of it, for one thing, right? And so you'd have to include lots of other species, uh, most of whom can't speak or communicate with us. So, you know, in fact, it would, it would be to think about um, life as it is, as, 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 as a political entity, right? And maybe that's what Latour means. It's not about convening a, something like the UN um, in the Amazon or something. It's, it's about um, 
thinking that politics is not restricted to human interactions, but that, that the, whole of, the whole of life systems are political. I think that's the idea. Yeah, thanks, Beth. I think this is really terrific. You're really, you know, taking us, at, as a lot of your work does, um, using Spinoza to think beyond Spinoza. Um, and, I, and I think it's, this is exactly what we should be doing in these two days. Um, and, you know, I feel very um, stimulated by what you've been saying. Um, and I'm in agreement with you right up until the last step. Uh, as you, yeah, you, yeah. You, you, you know that, you know that already, yeah. Um, but the last step I, I, I can't take, not simply because it's beyond Spinoza, I, I think it's beyond um, what can be done. So I want to ask you, you know, uh, draw you on more detail to, 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 to get more, uh, to get clarity around this. Um, I think Spinoza's <coughs> right. I, I think there are many beings uh, who are not similar to us at all, uh, with whom I don't believe we can develop any reciprocal relationship. Um, crocodiles, sharks, and so on. Um, I think there are many higher mammals with whom, uh, and I think, well, it's silly to say this, but I think he'd agree, but it's such a silly thing to say because who knows what he would agree with. Um, but I, we, know, we know now that some of the higher mammals really do have many powers that uh, we, we didn't realise before they had. So I do think there are um, opportunities for reciprocity with some of the higher mammals, but I don't believe that... Um, that there are uh, other, I don't believe that all, uh, you know, anim I don't believe we can form community with all animals. Um, and I think that's a problem with what you're saying. Uh, what I think is fantastic in what you're saying is that this shame and guilt and blame is just a waste of time. It's just taking energy away from, you know, all the things that we should uh, be focusing on, you know, the things we should be focusing on, are, as you say, precisely. Um, uh, taking seriously this idea that we are part of nature and it's just dawning on us now what that actually means, you know, to be part of nature. It means we have to care for the context in which allows us to be. Um, but I, I, I don't understand this notion of terrestrial um, citizenship and I don't, I, don't, I don't see how we can form an ethical community with beings um, where there's not, in, in my view, there's not the possibility um, of reciprocity. Uh, I think there, it, there is, um, you know, responsibility for caring and so on. So, so it, I mean, I've been reading Spinoza for so many decades now, uh, but it's only recently that I've, and you, you'd know this from you know, things we've uh, done <coughs> together before, but I'm coming to find this notion in Spinoza of fortitudo really interesting. Um, uh, and I've never noticed it quite so much uh, 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 in the past. And, and, uh, and it's got this double thing, hasn't it, of um, both care for the self, but also care for others. And it, not, not just other human beings, but care for, care for um, the context in which caring for the self is possible. But it has, it's that double, it's a virtue that has that kind of double... Um, relationship, um, but I, I guess I'd, I, where, where you ventured into the tour, I, I just think, I just don't know what it would mean. You know, I just don't. So it would be, I'd love to draw you a little bit more on that, like where there's no possibility for genuine ethical reciprocity. In, in precisely, I agree with the way you spell it out in terms of Spinoza, powers and so on, and you know, virtue, freedom. Um, so, sorry, that was another... Can I, can I just tag on another bit? Um, to, to critique the notion of free will in Spinoza, I'm with you there, um, but there is this notion of freedom uh, that I think maybe is underemphasised in what, in what you said. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's... It seems to me that's what we need to develop, and that can only be developed collectively, but I don't believe collectively with beings who, with whom we can't have reciprocal relations. 
and although the extension of the beings with whom we might have reciprocal relations is broader than he thought, I don't think it's as broad as Latour thinks. Mm -hmm. So could you respond mm -hmm. to those? Um, yeah, um, thank you. <laughs> I absolutely take your point and I, and I think on half of the days of the week I think what you're thinking <laughs> and the other half I think what I'm thinking. So, um, <laughs> so I, I think that, that, that a, a very different version of this paper could have ended up in a different place where we look at those passages whereby Spinoza stresses that the state relies on relationships with beings like us, that we cannot form a state with other kinds of beings and the reasons why animals and plants and so on cannot be citizens of the state, right? I, I absolutely agree. Um, so, so part of me really feels that you're right, that that's not, this is not Spinoza when we, when we go here. I guess what I was struck by um, and where, where the paper ended up was the way in which Spinoza sees, so I guess the paper is called Fear of Our Own Power, and that was really what I wanted to focus on was the fear. So I, it's not that I'm trying to solve the climate crisis. I mean, you know, far be it for me, it's ridiculous. Um, I, I'm, I'm more interested, I guess, in the thing that I think I can comment on as a philosopher is about the emotional state that we find ourselves in, right? So, so, so what I was trying to think about here is the way in which for Spinoza, what, how do we get over fear? How is it that we get over, and not just any fear, but fear of human power? How do we get over fear of human power? Well, we form the social contract and we, we get ourselves into the civil state. It turns out now, the civil state isn't enough, right? We, we still feel fear of our power. We now feel it for slightly different reasons than we did in the, you know, whenever this mythical past is supposed to be when the social contract um, takes place. Um, so, so it's not that we fear people, well, of course, some people do fear other people coming to kill them, but it's not that we any longer fear, you know, the other tribe coming to, coming to take over or burn our village or something. We now fear, fear our power to, to destroy our own future. And so I wanted to think through, well, what, what kind of political solution could we think of to overcome that kind of fear? And so that's, that's sort of where I was coming at, was the, just the notion that it's a, it's a form of political organization that's going to help us here. Um, and that's going to help us, help us to, to overcome the passion, but also to, to, um, to understand more clearly and rationally. In the same way that for Spinoza, the civil state helps us to understand things more clearly and rationally. Um, that's, that was sort of my motivation. How such a state is supposed to work, like I was saying a minute ago, I think is, you know, <laughs> a point that I'm not... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Beth. That was that was really um, intriguing. Uh, just, uh, I've got one question, but before that, um, just a question of clarification, I suppose. So, we know that we are collectively uh, participating in the commitment of in committing ecocide. We know that. We know that. We, but but we still keep on doing it. So is your, is your, um, what you're arguing here is that we, we continue to participate in ecocide um, because we fear our own power and therefore come to doubt our own power? Or have I gotten it completely yeah, wrong? I I think that's a large part of the story. So, so the answer to the question of why do we keep doing it if we know that it's wrong is that we... On some level, we don't know that it's wrong, right? <laughs> we do and we don't at the same time, right? So all of these, I mean, fear, this powerful emotion of fear, um, deprives us of, of the rational knowledge, even the rational knowledge that we already have, right? It cuts away at that. So it's not only because of the fear, it's also because of, you know, climate denial in the culture, it's because of, you know, governments who are in power fail to take action, it's all kinds of things. But, um, but you know, why do we keep, you know, even, even in terms of our own lives, we keep, eating meat, we keep using, you know, um, using cars and flying, pl flying in planes, flying here, you know, I, I'm as bad as anyone um, at doing those things. And it's, it's because we, on some level, we, we don't really have the adequate idea of what we're supposed to be doing, right? We think, we might think we do, but actually we just have a bunch of images and passions and it's, and it's, uh, you know, that's the spinozistic answer to that question anyway, I think. Can I just quickly uh, about the terrestrial terrestrial state, which which uh, I find very very fascinating. But I'm wondering uh, if it's already too late for a terrestrial state now that you know um, uh, the extraterrestrial is is again 
you know, uh, <laughs> being explored, and not just by <laughs> by by states and governments, but even by but even by corporations, and you know, uh, entrepreneurs such as Elon Musk and whatnot. So, <laughs> you know, uh, do we already need an extraterrestrial state to 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 truly care for for nature? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I guess, I mean, I guess. I mean, everything is part of nature for Spinoza, including other planets, other beings on other planets, uh, you know, parts of the universe that we have no concept of as yet. So I guess, you know, prospectively. But I think for the moment, let's focus on the one source of life that we know exists, which is, which is the Earth. <laughs> I think, uh, um, so, so, Beth, you, you talked about the social contract at some point, and I think, I think that might be, 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 be an, an important thing here. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, just before about what, what is what is required to 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 deal with this and 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 the thing is I think Spinoza has some sort of a, some sort of a, of, a, of a reply to this which which centers around a notion of civic education and which is which is not so much about uh, m making people understand in the end of the day but basically of Actually, maybe it's a bit of a it's a bit of a provocation to use that word, but I, I think it is appropriate. It's a form of indoctrination with particular kind of narratives, and one of those narratives, I think, the social contract, for example, for Spinoza, is a narrative. It's not true. It never happened. Huh? It's a story that is told in order for people to uh, uh, fulfill <coughs> their duty, uh, and their duty is to, let's say, uh, in, in Spinoza's free state, say. Uh, is a state in which people act according to their own rational self-interest. But much of the people who are acting according to their own rational self-interest don't do it out of knowing it. <coughs> They're doing it out of duty. They're doing it out of the duty they feel or civic duty towards a state to which they have committed. And what expresses that commitment well, what, com what expresses that commitment and the way that that commitment is grounded within each and in each individual citizen is through them being indoctrinated with the narrative of a social contract to which they have in principle committed. But they never did. It never happened. It's just a story. Huh? So, there has, so, so, so what I think uh, Spinoza would, be, would recommend here, again, is not so much that we need to gain knowledge about climate change, we need to change the narrative. I know it sounds stupid, but it's a stupid way of saying it. But but even even we need to change the narrative, which is a narrative about particular doctrines or or, or precepts of living uh, that you have to teach through education. So yes, uh, civic yeah. education. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. That's that's really helpful. And actually, I wonder if this is sort of how we can answer the question of like, well, how procedurally do you set up the terrestrial state? Maybe just like the civil state after the social contract, this is a story, right? This isn't supposed to be something real. I mean, same with, you know, when my students say, yes, but did all the, did all the people in the forest really come together and sign a contract? I mean, it's, it's, it's a moot question, right? It's a story, right? Social contract is a myth. It doesn't matter but, whether they have it. What, what matters yeah. is that you believe. That's right, that's right. Yes. So similarly, maybe the new narrative we need, and I'm not saying that it is necessarily, but maybe the new narrative that we need is the narrative of the terrestrial state and maybe that's the utility of it not that we think we have to actually procedurally set it up but that we use it as a story that yeah. we can buy into yeah. an, an imaginary if you like Teach our kids that, huh? mm. if if i may jump in yeah. the conversation so uh thanks very much I, I found that very interesting and i really liked the way in which you deconstructed some of the presupposition of the current discussion, especially about the idea that we are free and therefore we, we made it the wrong choices, right? And um, I see the point about the fear of power and how that plays a role in creating bad effects. But I, I'm also wondering whether there is another fear which is older and it's still there and it's kind of at the root or part of the root of the problem, which is exactly the fear for the non-human nature. Because if you think about why people wanted to develop this kind of rich, wealthy society, it's because living in nature is, well, it's, yeah. it's quite, yeah. I mean, dreadful, yeah. right? So how many people in this room could live without electric light, yeah. right? Or, or just in the dark or without iPhones, mm -hmm. just that, mm -hmm. right? So we would be scared mm -hmm. 
right? And I was thinking about, I mean, there is this poet in Italy who is also a philosopher, Sir Leopardi, has this wonderful poem, I was checking out the <coughs> English translation, so The Wild Broom, where he really presents this sense of fear towards nature. And I think that's still there. Mm -hmm. And until we react to that fear and seek escape from that fear and think that our good is to kind of fly from that fear, of course we need a wealth, we need a certain kind of infrastructure, and of course we need, even if we don't want to destroy nature, nature we need to use resources in a certain way. Now, if we look at Spinoza, of course Spinoza had an alternative, which is the supreme good. And the supreme good is the supreme good because it's pro produced by knowledge, it's available to everybody, it doesn't require electricity or many resources, just minimal quality of living, which is quite cheap. I mean, Spinoza himself was quite an easygoing guy. He never had to buy a house. He just lived, as you saw, probably in two rooms I in a friends, quite normal... His financed his life, I think. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, he was kind of living with a minimum. I mean, he didn't, never had yeah. great expectations about that because he could just enjoy the supreme good. Now, the problem is that in our society, the supreme good is just boring. You can't sell the supreme good, right? So, and we're not educated to just enjoy the knowledge of God, because what the hell this is supposed to be? So we, we go back to the problem of education, right? Because until everything is set up in terms of desires and achieving those desires to escape the sorrow that, that follows from not achieving them, of course, this is a self-feeding circle, so we'll never get out of it, even we very much like animals and we would like to do something for them. So I think it goes back to the ideas we discussed at the beginning this morning about the kind of ideas we fit in our minds, right? So maybe you have some thoughts about that. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I have anything else to add. I mean, thanks. I think that was really, really useful. I'm just happy for other people to contribute. So. Mm, I think maybe we haven't mentioned yet that there is something in Spinoza which is really um, troubling. It's a mode of thought. I doubt if we ever have experienced it. The mode of thought Spinoza is speaking about is a radically existentialist mode. It means that uh, it's absolutely connected to our life form. Thinking means that we are, have an enhancement of the potentiality to act. But the way how we think is really which critical theory would call instrumental logics. It's separated from our life forms. We have rational insights, scientific ones, philosophical ones, cultural ones, but they are, they are not connected to our um, ways how we um, produce our social forms of living. And that's, for me, my question to your approach, because I think the problem is not, of, not at all to... Uh, to hurt an animal or to kill an animal or a big fish eats a small fish. The problem is that um, if we go with a Spinoza's line of, con of, of the construction of thinking, we have to, from a positive effect, we have to jump into a common notion. That means we understand how our ways of living are constructed. And we live in absolutely bureaucratic, abstract, uh, situations, we, it's very hard to have a common notion of the, the super high levels of abstraction <coughs> leading to the climate catastrophe. It's not the big fish eats the small fish. It's uh, 500 years or even longer of instrumental logics, valorization, oppression, be it fish or plants or the next or the one of another race. I mean, it's, and that I think if we have a new terrestrial contract, it does not mean that we sit together with, with plants, because it's, Spinozism teaches us that it's all about difference. Singular, if we are on the level of intuition, which would be the furthest we could go, then we know that singularity means difference. Plants just, I think, they uh, ignore us. They don't want to sit with us in the parliament. It's our kind of colonizing plants to bring them, the, uh, to bring them into the parliament. We have to understand that the way, uh, like, human beings uh, try to construct their life forms, 
means to um, stop uh, being so um, in such destructive and obstructive ways, valorizing and um, resentfully destroying the earth, the other, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that leads to a last comment. I think as if we look at politics in Spinoza, from the backwards from the political treaties, we see a non-contractarian line of thought emerging within Spinoza at the end. He died then. At the, at the, this, the end of the PT is, uh, is a catastrophe because uh, of a lot of uh, difficult lines he brings up, but we can see the broken attempt to think um, an institution that comes from, the, from direct modes of cooperation. If we if, which is absolutely anomalous with, within early modern lines of political thought. That's how he, uh, he uh, kind of differs from Hobbes, not only on the modes of conatus and ethics and so on, but also uh, concerning the political construction of society. So I think, and that is very difficult to, to construct in such abstract societies. How should we do this with, with, uh, with council uh, uh, structures? I mean, what, what would be the terrestrial uh, contract if we think that at the end of his life, Spinoza wanted us to, to urge to think non-contractarian modes of uh, political society and to think this through difference? That difference and singularity is the mode to which we think our being in common. Um, I mean, I, I don't think I agree with you about the political treatise, but anyway, that's maybe a conversation for another time. Um, I mean, there was a lot. <laughs> there's a. <laughs> there, <laughs> um, I mean, there's a lot in your in your question and a lot of rich thinking, and I, I, I'm not going to be able to respond to it all now. But, of course, something I was thinking about when I was writing the paper is the, the question that you raised about would plants want to sit down with us, right? Why should we think that the other living beings on Earth want to be part of this thing? Um, so I think there's there's two ways of responding to it. So the, w the way I pursued in the paper was, was through this sort of James Lovelock way of thinking. Now, you know, Lovelock is not a philosopher, right? He's not thought deeply about the conceptual basis of all this. But, um, but I think if we follow Lovelock, what we realize is that it's not, it's not actually about wanting to sit down or wanting to form anything. It's about the fact that na life already is that, right? Life is an integrated system that all works to support life itself. And human beings have... have you know, on his view, sort of elected to take themselves out of that in a way, right? Despite the fact that we're still very bound up with it. So, so it's not that the rest of nature has to want to be part of it, it's that we have to want to be part of nature. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's what I was trying to get across. However, um, thanks to Moens, I think there's now another way to respond to this, which, which is to think about this, no, it's not about a literal parliament, it's, it's, about, it's about a narrative, it's about thinking differently about our place in nature. And it, it might be about thinking, um, thinking of our place in nature as, as a political act, as a, as a political, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's a way of thinking, right? It may not be the only way of thinking. There may be other, other ways of thinking. And maybe, maybe of thinking back through history as, as our integration of, in nature as always having been a political act. I don't, I don't know. Anyway. We have a strong... <laughs> I really would like to butt in. Uh, you're saying about the, the, the narrative of the social contract, you know, I think it's very, very valid up to this very day. When you look, uh, when you watch television, you see all these demonstrations, you see all these people uh, fighting against oppression and, 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 and marching for the climate, then they, then you will see that they bear ban, uh, banners, they hold banners in the air saying, we are the people. We are the people. It's very, you know, people are claiming the rights they naturally have in a social society. And it was also, of course, uh, very valid in the time of Spinoza himself with this freshly established republic coming from a compromise of freedom, of religion, uh, you know, all these things about, you know, the way Holland, the Netherlands were constructed. It was a social contract. It was literally a placard of verlating. It was really... Uh, a document, a paper signed by all the parties in which all these basic uh, 
um, freedoms were established, were put down on paper. It was literally, literally a contract. And it is just as valid now as it was then, because it is in accordance with the human soul, with the human <coughs> right, with the human being, with human essence. So not, you know, I'm really, um, it goes really against my grain hearing about the narrative should be changed, and people should be educa educated, and we don't know how it comes about. Just watch the television. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> okay. I mean, I think, uh, uh, yeah. So of course there are um, there are there are actual contracts, there are actual constitutions, there are actual documents that people sign to bring political bodies into existence. Of course, that's absolutely right. Um, and there are there are real rights that are entrenched in constitutions, and those are very important. And, and I'm not in any way trying to deny that they are. Um, However, the social contract narrative <laughs> is um, a device that's used, particularly in early modern philosophy, and it's not referring to those kinds of moments. It's referring to a mythical past that was a mythical past even for Spinoza and Hobbes. They're referring to some, to some past when human beings are literally sort of, you know, tribes people living in the forest, and the, the, it's, the, it's the mythology of how the state in its very origins comes to be, and that's why we're talking about it as a narrative. It's not to deny that um, that states and rights and, and, the, and the institutions that we have um, could be based on contracts. It's, it's this particular narrative that's used by these philosophers. That's, that's sort of what I was referring to. So. No, it's, it's Hobbes. It's Hobbes in, um, in the... Yeah. <laughs> so it's a, it's a long-standing story. Uh, no, not, not the state of nature as Hobbes describes it, no. <laughs> no, it was not. <laughs> so but can, the, I, can I just, yeah. because this was addressed to me as well, can I just make a Please. remark? So, so just in terms of real history, I'm not quite sure I agree with you about the, the constitution of, of the states of Holland. Uh, uh, the Union of Utrecht only became a constitution sort of post factum. So that's just as historical. I mean, it was only like when you actually get into the middle of the 17th century that the Union of Utrecht is really considered as anything like a real constitution. Now, uh, uh, that's Jonathan Israel, Cosman, the whole gang. Now, uh, 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 when, when, when you get to, but, but the other thing is that it's not, I get the impression that, that you feel it's sort of, it's a sort of a derogatory thing or it's a pejorative thing to say, but oh, it's just a narrative. That's not at all what we're saying here. It's not about it just being a narrative. It's about saying, and that's something that we, we have in Spinoza, is the idea. It is the idea that it is too much to ask of an entire people, let's say, let alone an entire planet of people, to become that rational, all of them, to all understand it is in their rational self-interest to not destroy the earth on which they're living. So what can we do instead? Well, we have another tool, which is an extremely powerful tool to regulate people's behavior when they don't have rational knowledge. And that tool is a narrative. It's what Spinoza calls a narrative. And one of those narratives is the narrative of a social contract, which is the narrative of why it is that you are committed to social life when you're not, you know, have the, the rational knowledge to, to, to know why it is that you are committed to it. So. Can, I, can, I try to, can I try to uh, mediate? <laughs> um, I, I think that's correct. Um, but I think it's also correct to say uh, that Spinoza is completely against narratives that mystify um, and that make it impossible uh, for uh, um, uh, uneducated uh, people or people who've not been fortunate enough to have the conditions of life that allow them to understand who and what they, what they are. So um, I've argued many places in my work, and I feel very strongly about this, that Spinoza is against any form of government that, um, uh, that uh, sets out to mystify, whether deliberately or not. So for him, I believe that these um, narratives 
uh, need to have um, uh, uh, um, need, need to be structured such that reasonable people can also endorse them and that they are structured in such a way that they don't block truth. Yeah? So, um, and, and I do think this is very important that we've brought up here the notion of education because he does say in the ethics, he doesn't have a lot to say about philosophy of education, but he does say in the ethics that, we should, that in a rational polity, we would educate our children um, in such a way that their bodies are turned into something else. He actually uses that, that kind of phrase, you know, that their bodies um, can be made, um, uh, that the kinds of things their bodies are capable of are, are realised to the absolute potential, uh, to, the, to, to, the, to the absolute degree that they can be. Um, and so I, I think, you know, what this is, what this is saying is that Yes, narratives are important, they have been, they always will be, but these narratives should be um, told in such a way that they don't actually block the capacity of people to, uh, to, to come to understand who and what they are and what their conditions of life are. So I think this also takes in what, what you were saying, which I think needs, I, I think there are connections um, here um, uh, that uh, uh, these, that that say the, what he has against theology is it does this thing of making, inverting causes and effects. They're bad narratives. So I think there are, there are enabling narratives and there are disabling narratives. And I... And I no. 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 Whatever you may say about Hobbes, yeah. But, uh, you know, he was very yeah. rooted in the Dutch Republic. As it uh, very, very, very much so. Uh, very much so. I agree with you. But I, can you see, I'm, I'm trying to build a bridge. Yeah. yeah. Um. <laughs> you want to go first? Just to follow up, maybe. Yeah. 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 So, so just to follow up on what Moens was saying about the need of narratives, because we can't use reason for the great mass of people. And of course, in Spinoza's time, sometimes there is this talk about the uneducated masses, right? And it, it kind of makes sense. But if today we think about the major actors responsible for the major problems, they don't look exactly like uneducated people. They may be have Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard degrees of some sort. So are they uneducated? If they can't understand reason, there, there is a massive problem. But not at the very bottom level of society, because those people, the great masses, don't have much to say about what's going on. It's at the very top level. So there is a kind of deep problem with how reason or non-reason appears and works in our society, which probably, I'm not sure whether was the case in Spinoza's time, I never thought about that. But if you think about our condition, here the problem is that the very educated people who have all the knowledge and power, they are those who seem to act in a more rational way. And that's a real puzzle, I, I would say. I, I, I don't have any solution to this, I was just noticing. It's uh, maybe very similar in other words. I think uh, uh, coming back to what you said that there is a, in a way, there is a, to, to my view, maybe you don't agree, uh, a deep anarchism in Spinoza's thought. And, but he enters himself this anarchist line of thinking only through sequences of apparee. So Spinoza himself, I mean, he, still in the ethics, we have the notion that a fearless multitude is a oh. bad thing. Oh. That we have to, that would mean we have to terrify the people oh. so that they don't become a reactionary mob because uh, Spinoza himself, apropos fear of the capacity of the people, he was uh, testifying to reactionary and right-wing mass upheavals. And he also testified to the failure of the English Revolution. So he is very much someone who knows that within history there is no no goal and salvation or something quasi-religious which, which is guaranteed. People have, in a way, to fight for this and to participate in it. That's the only way. And the idea of the civic religion 
in the TTP or the idea that we offer a narrative, this is something when we read him back from the political treatise, which is always in danger to flip back into a pedagogy of obedience. And that means of leadership, and that means of corruption of the entire process of liberation. But still, as thinker of producing liberation, and not just liberation, but we have to produce it, and produce it against the experience of its failure, corruption, that even those who want to liberate themselves and others destroy their, their own proper experience of liberation. That is a super modernity of uh, Spinoza, that he does not kind of idealize the process of revolt or revolution. But that means that we have with the political treaties to get rid of any kind of enlightenment or all those liberal elements within the PTT, I think is uh, uh, TPP, <laughs> TPP is uh, sublated in the later kind of work and still letting us with the question how to come into that process of self-liberation. It cannot be an enlightened elite, elite that helps the more dumb people to kind of yeah, uh, do it with half of the thought or just like so. And I mean Spinoza, he, it took his entire intellectual life to arrive at that last anarchistic uh, line of thought. Can I say? Yeah. So, um, I think with Beth, I, I, I think we both disagree on your reading of the TTP, but that's another story. Um, so, uh, um, I, think, I think this kind of line of thought, I think you're asking too much. Uh, you, you're asking you just you're asking too much of it. It's like Spinoza. It, it, it is like Spinoza was requiring people to become wise, all of them. It is too much. It it it, it, it takes out the realism of, of his political philosophy, and and uh, uh, so so um, so. The thing I actually wanted to respond to was more was more was was Andrea, what, what he said about okay. So the problem today is is that you have you have people who are really well educated and who seem to do seemingly irrational things. Huh? I have uh, high level super professors of philosopher colleagues in Oxford who are for Brexit. How does that happen? <laughs> huh? yeah. how, how is that even possible? Well, it, apparently it is possible. Now, all kinds of narrow-minded self-interest involved in that, but that's another story. But it also has something to do with the kind of education that you give. I mean, there's not, there's not just education. There's education and education. And I think the kind of education that Spinoza has talked with, that, that we're talking about here, which is relevant here, that's why I said just before, I think we have to think about it as a kind of republican ideal an old school Roman republican ideal of civic education where you teach the people certain duties towards their fellow man and towards society as a whole. And that kind of civic education is something you give to children in the form of teaching them certain doctrines. And the doctrines that you teach them in Spinoza's version, it's the doctrines of universal faith that he describes in chapter 14 of the TTP, and it is the doctrine of the social contract. And those doctrines, none of them are true. None of it happened, it's actually not, and there are pieces of the, of the doctrines of universal faith, it's actually not true that you will be saved. You need, no. you need to explain that because they're, okay. true, they're, they're, not, neither, so, they're neither no. true nor false. <coughs> that's they're the mean, point. They're meaningful. That's exactly. What these narratives do is that they don't, they, you, you be, when you believe in them, they will incite you to behave in a particular kind of way. They're practical. They, they will invite you to make practical precepts. So what you need to do here is to teach certain doctrines which are not exactly true, but are useful for people to get them to behave as if they were rational. Huh? So you indoctrinate them. You indoctrinate your kids. That's what you need to do. You need to indoctrinate them with a, with a, with a Gaia theory, and you need to indoctrinate them with a social contract theory. Go out and do it now. <laughs> no, no, no. So not just any education, but...
Yeah, it's a, it's a question. I don't know if I can. Maybe I can take this one. It's just, okay. uh, if I may, um, just join in because just on this morning on the radio, there was a discussion about whether it was ridiculous to like um, honor and respect animals just as much as humans and. There was an example um, th that one of the speakers said that there's a dung beetle that eats up the um, shit of cows in Europe. It's been always in Europe. And then the, they were exporting cows to, I think, cows. And no, th he, this person talked about cows. And, and the, it, that it, they were exported to, I think, New Zealand. And then they were shitting everywhere. And, until the dung beetle was introduced in New Zealand, the, the, the landscape was covered in this shit. And now there is a, there's like a, um, a plague of dung beetles, but the dung beetles have their use. So in this sort of total cycle of nature, like every little creature, if, even if you've never thought about them, they have their purpose. Maybe the crocodile has a purpose that is not visible to us, but they might have their purpose too. I mean, this is just a question. It's like a sort of honor your, if you think of a narrative, honor everything that's sort of alive, maybe. I mean, I can get really irritated by ants, but they have a purpose to eat like some bugs, I'm sure. So that's the thing. It's, it's like maybe that could be included in this narrative of social um, yeah, e equality or so. I don't know. That's just a comment. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a, it's a big challenge for us because we have a, um, yeah, a compelling narrative. We need a compelling narrative which, uh, which everybody can uh, kind of buy into without completely understanding it, or maybe just accepting that it maintains a, a livable status quo. I think that's basically that uh, what I'm thinking of now is that... Um, do we, do we need to have a sort of representational authoritarian reason, like institution of authoritarian reason, or something like that? That, you know, that somehow uh, the reason, the, the people who really know, like the scientists, and they, they all criticize each other, you know, it's open source, they can audit each other's algorithms and, uh, and just determine what is really best for us in the long term, in the grand complexity, in the thick present as, as Donna Haraway puts it, that uh, they, can, they can negotiate, they can figure out uh, the, the real economics and uh, ecologistics of, uh, of our condition and, and negotiate the way forward with all the dung beetles uh, and, and the, uh, the, the crocodiles and the, 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 and the sharks <laughs> and the complexity. And that, you know, in a way, we need to... Uh, Institution, institutionalized sounds strange because in English we mean they put them in the insane asylum, but uh, we need to uh, uh, set up a kind of institution which is a representative, representative institution of reason, which, <laughs> which we can turn to to provide the narrative. Yes, this is, okay, you're gonna suffer, you can't drive your diesel tractor so much anymore. We're gonna, you're, you're, we're gonna do things differently. Your family's gonna live a bit differently and you have to uh, uh, accept it, but it'll be better for all of us. But it has to, you know, uh, Spinoza was, not, was quite sanguine about, the, uh, about what kind of uh, uh, governmental systems, what kind of uh, structure of society uh, would be adequate to bring about the ideal circumstances for people. He was not so convinced of, of uh, that, that democ democracy would be, or that we're ready for it. And that maybe we need this uh, uh, in the meantime, some kind of, uh, you know, um, I guess you would call it aristocracy of some kind. That it might be corrupted or not, but hopefully it would be auto-correcting. Uh, well, um, if you want me to respond to that, I mean, I, th I, don't, think it's, um, I don't think it's up to scientists to, to tell us how to live. Um, it's not their job, it's not what they're good at. It's up to scientists to diagnose what the problem is, maybe to find some pragmatic solutions. Um, but I think, I think from a Spinoza perspective, it's up to all of us to, to understand how to live and that how to live is somehow embedded in our nature and we have to work away at, at, at trying better to rationally understand how our nature really is embedded in nature. Um, so I, I, don't, I wasn't 
in any way sort of uh, endorsing a, a kind of a setting up of some authoritarian scientific <laughs> council or something I, I that was. would tell us what to do. I mean, I mean, it, w it may well be the case that setting new rules for human behavior is something that we need to do in the short term in order to, you know, make it through the next decade. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, maybe we do, you know, I think governments need to take action on, on uh, air travel, for instance. They just need to make flying much, much more expensive. And, and maybe we do need those kinds of rules um, just in order to change our behavior. But, um, but I think what you're, what you're referring to is just is just new rules that humans give each other. And as I say, we might need those, but I think what I'm suggesting here is something rather different than that. It's not just new rules for humans to govern ourselves with. It's, it's a new way of, well, not really a new way, an old way, a spinozistic way of thinking about ourselves as, as members of something bigger. I guess. Yeah, um, I'd like to add um, two things, I think. Um, one is that Spinoza himself made a distinction that we now take for granted in philosophy. Um, so we, we would maybe talk about ontology and then metaphysics, or we talk about political philosophy, but we also talk about practical philosophy. And he certainly made that distinction between practical philosophy and what he called natural philosophy, which we would now call science. So I think that's right, that the scientist does have certain kinds of knowledge, uh, but they're not necessarily, the scientist or the natural philosopher it's not necessarily the case that <coughs> she can tell us anything about how to live pra pragmatic, you know, about pragmatics, about practical philosophy. So I think that's still something that you know we 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 could keep in mind. Um, and I had another point to make, which I've now forgotten, um, but I guess it'll come back, yeah, yeah. later. Everybody's getting a little bit. Uh, oh, there's a there's a question in the back too. Um, and another one there, okay. Uh, no, I was just getting to the, the, question, the point that uh, actually our problem is not nature, it's other humans. And uh, that, uh, that, that is nature. That is nature, <laughs> but, I mean, but we, can, we can address other humans uh, uh, and through those. Um. Oh, sorry, that was the other point, very yeah, quickly, okay. that I wanted to make. That when Moans is talking about indoctrination, it's not as if we're not indoctrinating people now. Like, whenever you educate, you indoctrinate. So it's not like, you know, Moans is saying, oh, we need to start indoctrinating. It's mm -hmm. rather, we do indoctrinate, but the way we're indoctrinating is disabling us, and we need more enabling narratives. So that's why I wanted to stress before uh, that when he said it's not true. Well, it's not false either. This isn't about truth and falsity. And that might be, they might be concepts useful in science. I don't think they're concepts that are useful in practical philosophy where what we need to acknowledge is that we live through certain kinds of meanings, constructing certain kinds of meanings. And truth and falsity is the wrong register. Yeah. That, that's so, but just to say false might make it sound like I've got the true view. Yeah, yeah. It's not, that's not, yeah, I know, I know it's not what you mean, but, you know, it, just to be clear about that, it's that this isn't about truth and falsity, it's about how can we enable ourselves to live more comfortably than we're living now, yeah? Just... I, I don't think it is necessarily about adequacy either. I think, uh, yeah, in the Spinoza sense, adequacy is about truth, so... Well, um, sorry. Uh, coincidentally, I also had a question about education um, because um, I am myself a big fan of Michel Foucault, and I think that regarding education, the way in which we organize education as well is very important, and the fact that it is tied to the physical location of the school. And if you ask the question in, of why is it uh, that our political leaders that are all so well educated are the ones that are wrong. It's maybe that they are educated in a wrong place. And maybe if you think that they are educated in a prison, it's maybe more rational to conclude then that people who are educated in a prison are then also um, lead us in a bad way. Whereas if they were educated in a sort of pure academic environment, as many people seem to think academia is, instead of um, 
uh, restricted to this physical location of the school, which has its own detrimental effects. What do you think about that? Thank you. <laughs> so, I, I, I don't know what I think about it, but, but I, I can say something about what Spinoza thought about these things. Um, now, now, in terms of, of the kind of education that he would recommend, he was quite close to a bunch of people in his very sort of uh, immediate. Uh, he doesn't say so much about education. I make exactly what he what he wants to do. He, it's quite clear when you read the TTP that he wants to have some sort of educational reform, but what that's supposed to look like is really very quite vague. But if you look in his immediate surroundings for thinking about this, you will find programs, educational reform programs in the Dutch Republic that are quite um, contiguous to what he's saying, and that's mostly in Adrian Korbach and in Franciscus van den Enten, uh, who both had, especially van den Enten, very elaborate theories for how they would, how they would construct uh, 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 educational reform in the Netherlands so as to facilitate true Republican freedom. And the way that it should look like for van den Enten, and I think it would look like something like that for Spinoza as well, was he wanted to set up not what you talk about as real academic, sort of high-flying academic university education, no, it's something like community colleges. Community colleges that were supposed to be built out in the local communities and that would be state funded but not at all state controlled. I mean, if you look at educational reform in Hobbes and Spinoza and try to compare them, you will see very, very striking contract where Hobbes has these ideas of educational reform where you have strict sovereign control in a virtual system of education where you make sure that universities are absolutely under the control of the sovereign power. Now, Spinoza did not at all function like that. He really has this idea that, or that's the, the kind of educational system that would fit what he thinks about education, and that you would have to spread out, uh, put the educational structures under government funding, but not under government control, but you would have pockets of what he calls free philosophizing huh, set up. It's such as in liberal arts colleges, in community discussions. I, I find the net and had a fantastic theory. But you have universities where you would drop the uh, ideas of having professors and lecturers and students. Huh? They were all supposed to be on the same level. Huh? And they were all supposed to be discussing with each other sort of critical. And what was this set up? This was like the collegian meetings. Huh? When like, was so this is, this is uh, Franciscus van den Ende's uh, free political propositions from, I think, uh, 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 16, what, uh, 55? 50, 50, 1650, something like that. So, so, and it was basically modeled on the way that a guy called Plokhoi, uh, who was a collegian, had described and had set up collegian uh, 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 meetings. Uh, 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 in, in, in the Dutch Republic. So, so this is the kind of educational reform he's talking about. But I still think there is some level of, uh, let's say, say of, of, of structure to the kind of education that is supposed to be deployed within these community colleges. And, those, and that minimal structures is that you have to teach them at least minimal civic duties. And those minimal civic duties you have to teach them by means of narratives that will teach them that you have to respect the state, you have to obey the state, the law. You don't just go out and become a rebel. Huh? If you want to resist, you have to do it in the right forum and become what he calls the best citizen. Huh? Huh? That's the one thing. So you believe in the narrative of social contract. And the other thing, you have to believe in the doctrines of universal faith, which are the kind of doctrines that will make you charitable and loving kindness towards your fellow man. Without that, it won't work. So those are just the basic doctrines that you would have in this educational system. Otherwise, it's just about, you know, people will critically discuss with each other and philosophize freely, as you call it. No? Is, that a, is that a reply? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's only a small remark for uh, all the Dutch uh, people. Our philosopher of state, René ten Bos wrote this book, and it's about your story, about the contract, it's dwelling in the Anthropocene, it's about the contract with nature, about the contract with yourself. So if you need a lot of information about your story, about the backgrounds, I don't know if it's in English, but you have to read this.
I just would like to remind us that we are re that we are touching here on a really deep controversy within Spinoza's studies, how we read those, for example, those questions of education. In in a lot of what you are saying, I, I would be d'accord, and I think it's also regarding your question that that Spinoza, as a thinker of the production of thought, cannot say, okay, everyone is just thinking and that's it. And it comes like it, it uh, so the entire thought of Spinoza circles around how do I come into, which is in the TTP still the question, into a good cycle. I need a narrative. I need a civil religion. I need a school into a, a cycle of faith, of basic commitments, of, but we know that this, that this is a problem of enlightenment proper. Who teaches the teacher? What happens to the teacher? That was Foucault's question. Minoritarian politics started with what is what happens to the Enlightenment movement? How could it happen that the, that the rational and the Dutch uh, heritage of rationality and trade was intertwined with colonialism, irrationality, and ultima mi barbarorum, and not only the killing of the David brothers, Spinoza was also an early critique, may, maybe the first early critique of liberalism, and uh, advising his friends in the Liberal Party to be aware that each doctrine, each faith, each civic religion is only as strong as the uh, relational forces of the masses that underlie and live this doctrine. So in the PT, I think for the first time, Spinoza comes close to the idea that in a way we have, I mean, we have to, we have to produce our thinking, we have to educate our children, but in that process has to be a dialectical twist of self-abolishment of the teacher of the erasement of the figure of the leader. That is, I mean, if, if we want to have communal universities or colleges, we have to teach how we get rid of ourselves, how we leave the podium. That would be our gesture now, leaving that place, not sitting above. I mean, stopping with that uh, division. Uh, division. Yeah. And uh, realism, the realism of Spinoza is that there is no guarantee and no real probability that we come ahead with this. No reason, but no not, reason. but he was, he was as optimist as pessimist. That is a great thing. I mean, he was not shying away of thinking the self-government of the people and being capable of each man can think. And he only also meant women. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, <laughs> I think it's time for us to leave the uh, stage and join uh, the, the, the radical horizontality. It may not work out. That's